Good morning. morning. We're glad you're here, gathered together at Westminster Presbyterian Church to worship the Lord and to enjoy each other's fellowship. I want to begin by thanking uh, John Brock, who's been our music leader and organist while Peter had a much needed time away. Well, thank you for that. I want to remind you again that uh, the lemonade will be available in the Schilling Gallery uh, after church, so it's not out in the hot sun. It's out where it's cool. There's beautiful artwork there, so please take advantage of that. Uh, As also out there are vegetables from our garden, other people's garden that we can share with each other. So next Sunday, if you get here at 11 o'clock, you'll be too late. <laughs> so next Sunday, when we start uh, for August, we'll have a single service at 10 o'clock here uh, in the sanctuary. Buren may be here in his biking clothes, I don't know, but he's supposed to be back here for next Sunday. So we'll look forward to that. Please join me in our call to worship this morning. The foolish say, there is no God. We are alone on our own. The foolish say, it is your life. You are accountable to no one. The foolish say, everything I have is mine. I owe nothing to anyone.
this space and at this hour, we open our hearts and minds to God, confessing the ways in which we have faltered, finding the ways to do more and better. Let us, as one body, offer our confession to God. Gracious Lord, deep within, we know how we have failed to be your people. Our heart and hearts are closed to the love of Christ. Our lust for more and more lost fullness of your grace from transforming our lives. Our trust and power of the world reveals our foolish nature. Have mercy, God of every generation. Pour out the rich blessing of forgiveness on our parched souls. Feed us with heaven's bread so we might be nourished by your gentleness. Shape us as your people and restore us to faithful living as we seek to follow our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in service of everyone. Ours is a faith of grace and mercy. We are awash in God's love and the love of our community, finding in this shared faith a fervent acceptance of our whole selves. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we love you. first scripture reading this morning comes from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. And now, if the kids want to come forward, Rachel Powell has a very, I think, worldly lesson for them, it looks like. Good morning, everybody. All right. How are y'all doing this morning? Okay. So I brought, I brought this today. Do y'all know what this is? A globe, exactly. So it's basically a 3D map of the world. I think they're fascinating. Um, I brought it today because there's a big athletic competition going on in Japan. You all know what it is? The Olympics. Uh, yeah, the Olympics. Do you all know what the Olympics is? So on this map, here's where we are. We're in the United States, about right here. And you have to go all the way over to this side. There. That's Japan. You see how far away it is? It's crazy. And so you want to see? What you've got is you've got these athletes that come from all over the world. 
to this one place, every, it's every four years. And you know, they have swimming competitions, and they have track and field. The swimming's my favorite. Gymnastics, what's your favorite? Swimming. Swimming, yeah, me too. Do you know this year they've got skateboarding? How crazy is that? I know, it's crazy. So the thing is, I was watching swimming last night, and it was making me think about this whole world. All these people come from all over the place, and they all look different, and they speak different languages, and they pray differently, and they eat different food. But it was reminding me of two big things. God made all of these people, and it's a big, crazy, beautiful world we live in. And it's such a wonderful chance for everybody to come together and really get to know some of their neighbors from across the planet. And the other thing that was making me think, you know at the end of the swimming races and, and track and field when you got, uh, they cross the lane ropes and even if they just beat you, they hug each other, or they do elbow bump, fist bump, and it's just a, so nice to watch. It's like at the end of your soccer games when you, you know, do good game, good game, or you wave your baseball cap. It's just like that, only it's the best athletes in the world, and even if they lost, they're just happy to be there, and they're happy for the people in the lane next to them or who race next to them. So I, it just made me think, at its ideal, I think the Olympics is probably the way God wants us to live our lives in the whole world. Be thankful and grateful for a big, beautiful, crazy world, and be thankful and grateful for your neighbors who will celebrate with you um, no matter what the outcome of it is. So enjoy the Olympics. Have a good time. The swimming is still going on. I'll watch more of that tonight. Um, let's say a prayer, and then you all can go downstairs. Okay? Okay. Dear God, thank you for this big, crazy, beautiful world full of all kinds of different people. And Thank you for the opportunity to meet them, to worship with them, to love them, and to get to know them. And we pray all this in your son's name. Amen. In case you haven't noticed, uh, Ann and Tim Cray are going for the group discount today. <laughs> okay, that's not my fault. <laughs> Our scripture reading today is from uh, the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John. Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? Jesus said this to test Philip, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, six months wages would not buy enough bread each of them to get a little. One of Jesus' disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he gave thank, had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them to get up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because of a strong wind was blowing. When they rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But Jesus said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then, he, then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land to which they were going. This is the word of the Lord. In 1928, Otto Frederick Rowetter invented the machine that makes us make sliced bread. 
Yeah, it was a big deal. And so uh, it was sold regionally for a while. And then in 1930, a national brand took it over and started selling it everywhere. And that national brand is known as Wonder Bread. That's the first national brand of sliced bread. And all was great. By 1932, most people were eating sliced, pre-sliced bread. But during the Second World War, one administrator was concerned about the amount of materials that went into the machinery and to the wrapping of the sliced bread. So he banned sliced bread in January. And there was such an uproar and protests and complaints that by March it had to be rescinded. So don't just take your sliced bread for granted. It could go away any day. The feeding story we have in the Gospel of John today is, is the same story basically we have in all four of the Gospels. It's the only story that's in all four of the Gospels somewhat with the same framework. John being John who's telling it some 30 something years later than Mark first wrote it is adding extra stuff as is John's way. John's gospel tends to be more about staging and scenery as much as it is about the plot. So in John's story, it's, it's Passover. And instead of people going to Jerusalem, 5,000 plus people have followed Jesus to a hill near the coast of Galilee. And John with his focus on the Greek audience and culture has made Philip, the, the most Greek of the disciples, the focus. And John tells us, this is going to be a test of Philip. So Jesus said, tells him, where are we going to buy bread for all these folk? And Philip says, a half year wages wouldn't cover it. A very practical Presbyterian kind of answer. Now what's interesting to me is that in none of the four versions of the story, in any of the four gospels, none of those stories to the people that are there ask to be fed. There's nobody that raises their hand saying, where's lunch? There's nobody saying, you know, how are we going to feed? How are we going to eat out here? They're never asked. It's always initiated from Jesus and the disciples. And it also does not appear in the Gospels to be a regular part of Jesus' ministry to do healing and teaching and feeding whoever's there. That's just not, those stories just aren't there. So maybe that's already some hints that this story is not just about a feeding miracle. Now Andrew speaks up and launches a million Sunday school lessons and children's sermons about how a little boy shared his Lunchables with the crowd. And because they were barley loaves, which is the cheapest, lowest kind of bread you, anybody could have back then, they're not even branded Lunchables. I mean, they're just off-brand Lunchables and everybody gets fed because of it. And then Jesus, of course, takes the loaves and the fishes according to the story and proceeds to pray and to distribute them. Ron Scheib is the minister of First Presbyterian Church in Burlington, North Carolina, and he's a good friend of mine, and several years ago he invited me to come preach, and just like us, they have two services, and it was, it was a communion Sunday, so there was going to be communion at both services. But the first service, again like us, it's, it's a smaller crowd, and the plate that came up had a big loaf of bread in the middle, and around it are those little crackers that I, I remember eating when I was a Methodist, the little communion, little bitty wafer things. So it became pretty obvious that the bread was symbolic. The crackers are what was actually going to be eaten. And so I looked at Ron and saw what he was doing and I did the same thing. So come 11 o'clock and it's, we're in the big room and there's all kinds of people there now. The plate comes up and I don't pay much attention to it because uh, that's what happens with me. Anyway, I noticed that the little crackers weren't there. So it came time to break the bread and I broke the bread up in big hunks like I did the first time. Quickly to realize that was all of the communion bread. And I'd already given half of it away. So I'm sort of breaking it into smaller pieces and smaller pieces. And I'm pretty sure the people in the back rows just got the hint of bread. I don't think they got any bread at all. So this is a slow moving, if we take the story the way it's written, a slow train moving kind of miracle. Repetitive action over and over and over again, breaking this bread, a very slow thing. And then afterwards, it tells us they gathered 12 Tupperwares full of leftovers. And this, the people there are thinking, in 2 Kings, Elijah did the exact same thing. He had 20 loaves and he fed 100 people with it and he told his servant there'll be plenty that we left over. And so they're saying, Jesus indeed must be the prophet who has come into the world. So what do we make of this story? Is it really just about sharing that everybody there secretly was packing a lunch and shared it out of guilt or because of some inspiration because of the little boy? Is it certainly the church has taken it that way for years and years and years. And I was a little nervous, Rachel, that you were going to go that way too. I'm glad you didn't. So, you know, it's just, just about a little boy sharing his lunch. Is that all that's there? Or do we live into the miracle? 
that Jesus converted five loaves and two fish into a banquet for 5,000 people. It's sort of uncomfortable to me to think in 2021 that at one time, God took hunger on and won and stopped. Why doesn't God still do that? I was kind of stuck on this part of the story and was really couldn't get my head past where I was stuck, so I decided to get out of my house and go for a ride. And I got into my car because I have good sense for my ride. So I went, down the, I went down a road near us out in Sevier County that I've never been down before and went three or four miles in the country and I saw two trailer parks, one junkyard, and one working farm that had a few cows on it and one large field of soybeans. With so many people hungry in this world, why do we also have so many fallow fields waiting for subdivisions to jump up? And why tell a story about solving hunger if you're, going, if you're not really going to solve hunger? First United Methodist Church in Farragut just yesterday uh, gave food to over 150 families that needed food out in Farragut. Think about that. So it really, but it dawned on me on my little road trip that this is really not a 2021 question. But this has been a question all along about this story and that in the 30 years from when Mark first wrote the story down to when John wrote it down again, people got up every day and had to find something to eat. People got up a lot of times and went to bed that night with nothing to eat. Hunger was still part of the framework. So to me, it tells me this story is, has something to say besides just another version of the Hunger Games. What does it mean for Jesus to be the bread of heaven? And what does that mean for us? I think Philip represents all all of us a lot of the time when we say our faith is just not big enough. It's not strong enough. We're not hope-filled enough. Whatever challenge we're facing, whatever struggle we're in, whatever problem that's coming at us, we just don't feel spiritually full enough or adequate to meet the challenge. So we get scared and we get hopeless and we kind of make bad decisions. And there are just those places in our life where that gap is so big that we just, we just wonder, how are we going to meet that? How are we going to face this sickness? How are we going to face this money issue or this aging issue or this oppression issue or, this, or our family, whatever struggle your family's in? How are we going to face that? Because I just don't feel faithful enough to be able to see the way through. Or those times when we have a place in life where we stumble and we fall or something we tried to do didn't work out and the next morning you're in bed and saying, how am I going to get up? and go at it again. Where is the faith for that? Well, in in the Ephesians part that Daniel read, which is really a prayer from Paul, he talks about another kind of fullness. To know the love of God that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, in the temptation stories of Jesus, there are three different temptations, but two show up in this story. One is that he turns stones into bread, And the second is that he ruled the world. Both of those things are are edged in this story. The 5,000 want to make him king, and they all, he basically turned bread out of nothing. But what we're really looking for is is Jesus to give us something that kings can't give us, which is a well-fed soul, rooted and grounded in love. We hunger for something that's not a thing but a spiritual diet that gives us peace and joy and purpose and and meaning and happiness in our life. And when we think we are not enough, not loved enough, then then the bread of heaven kind of comes along and starts to fill in that gap. Jesus is telling us to come to him in our want, to bring our meager scraps of faith, and he will turn them into a feast of fulfillment. Have the confidence to surrender a short, cramped mortal life He'll he'll give you back an immortal life of endless joy. So when we take our scraps of faith and give them to Jesus, and he gives us back this feast of fulfillment, that's a type of liberation. It's a type of being free. So then the second part of this John story is another story of Jesus and the disciples in a boat. Now Jesus, after feeding the 5,000, and they're worried about, he's worried about them making him king, he takes off. He goes up into the hills to get away from them, and I think probably to get away from the disciples, just to, get, just to get away. Enough is enough. So the disciples don't wait around for him, which there's some loyalty issues right there I'd have to deal with. 
So they get in a boat and they head across the Sea of Galilee towards Capernaum and a storm breaks out. Now you would think by this point the disciples would check the weather before they get in a boat to go across this sea. <laughs> Nothing good ever happens. So they're out there, they're struggling, rowing against a strong wind, and then there's Jesus. He's walking along, he says, hey, and you know, I am the I am, and don't be afraid. And they were safe. So when we're full of the love that God gives us, and we have, there's no real room for fear to live and dwell and have its being. The fear of not being enough, the fear of being empty of purpose, the fear of being empty of love, all that, that's, there's, all those fears don't have room there. When God, when we allow God to really fill us up with this bread of heaven, that is Jesus. So we are, in a sense, liberated. Peter was afraid of the opinion of the crowd. We can't possibly imagine what that's like, can we? But Jesus liberated him from that fear of scarcity by showing his presence to, to, to Philip. There is a bread of heaven. The people have got it wrong in the church, but mostly got it right, that the story of the 5,000 is not a story about ending hunger, the story about ending a deeper hunger that we all deal with every day. In this gospel, in every passage of the good news, there is a single unifying message. God loves us. And Christ is literally the embodiment of that love. When we see scraps, God creates abundance. When we see emptiness and depression, God creates profound fulfillment and boundless joy. In God's love, we are nourished and we are protected. Christ is the bread of life, infinitely enriched and multiplied for our salvation. We need to go to this feast and never walk away hungry. We need to live in this love, and the feast never ends. But I want to say a word about Andrew, because Andrew, he, gets, he usually gets most of the play, but he has some other things to say. Andrew saw some hope in this kid's lunch. That's at least that's part of the story. Saw some hope in this kid's lunch. So I want to talk about other Andrews uh, in the world. But one very close to us is Isaac Anderson. See what I did there? Went right from Andrew to Anderson. So he had, he had a vision. He saw a need. There were, all the, there were these people on this part of, of the side of the Appalachian Mountains who needed to have ministers who were learned. So he, he couldn't, he wanted to make something happen. So he started what became known later as Maryville College. Five students. Five students in 1819. Five students. Not very promising. But of course, it's 200 years later, it's still providing people who want to change the world. Southminster Presbyterian Church in Boise, Idaho is roughly a third the size of us, around 200 something members. And they had a, 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 a issue on their heart. And their heart and the issue was medical debt for people who are struggling with medical debt in their community. So they worked with an outfit called RIP, which buys medical debt for pennies on the dollar. The, the church raised $15,000 and they were able to wipe off the books $1.6 million in medical debt, a third the size of us. And right here, right here in uh, River City, right here in, in Knoxville, with some of the people that you're worshiping with today, we came together with people from other churches and other synagogues and other temples and mosques. We came together and we uh, lobbied, like you have to do, spent five years, five plus years, working with the city of Knoxville and the county of Knox County. And as you know, the mayor last winter made a commitment to have an affordable housing trust fund because people of faith got together, saw the Andrew potential and went for it. They also pressed the school system to develop an alternative discipline system so it's not a strict school to prison pipeline, but kids are actually uh, treated and staff as a holistic thing, deal with problems in their schools. The, the, the school system, the bus system is going to try a, a micro buses to help people get to work and to get to their daycare and to get to their doctors and all these other things that a fixed transit system can't do. And we're still fighting with our county to try to address the serious issues of mental health in our community. I'm going to paraphrase Margaret Mead and say, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed people of faith can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. So as last of the prayer that Daniel read, now to God who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish far more than all we can ask or imagine, 
To God be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen and amen.
Please join me in our affirmation of faith. We share one faith, have one calling, are of one soul and one mind, have one God and Father, are filled with one spirit, are baptized with one baptism, eat of one bread and drink of one cup, confess one name, are obedient to one Lord, work for one cause, and share one hope. Together we come to know the height and the breadth and the depth of the love of Christ, are built up to the stature of Christ, to the new humanity, know and bear one another's burdens, thereby fulfilling the law of Christ, that we need one another admonishing and comforting one another, that we suffer with one another for the sake of righteousness. Together we pray, together we serve God in this world. Please be seated and join me in prayer. Lord God, be with us. Be with us in our communal prayer be with us in our moments of doubt. Be with us, bless. <laughs> Be with us in times of pain and times of crisis. Be with us to steady our hands and our hearts. Be with us as we mourn. Be with us in sickness. Be with us in death. Be with us in the daily small victories of life. Be with us in the huge, life-changing, world-altering events, too. Be with us at dawn and at dusk. Be with us as we sleep and we dream. Be with us as we protect your creation, as we clash with one another and work for better, as our days increase, as we rise in body and spirit to respond to your word through sacrament and service, as we pray the words you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and power and the glory forever. Now, if you'll take a moment, um, the friendship registers are in the ends of the pew. You'll sign those as we move into a time of offering.
Let us pray. Lord, help us to continue to discover the abundance of your love and grace for us, the gifts every day that make this world a place worth living for you. And give us the energy and the Andrew kind of sense to go out and serve others. In Jesus' name, amen. Sisters and brothers, let's be honest with ourselves that we all have our Philip moments when we don't see all that God has given us, but let's also listen to the Andrew moments when what little bit we have can change the world. And now may the God who has come to us in Jesus Christ and equipped us by the power of the Holy Spirit to be God's daughters and sons in this world go to each and every one. Amen.